Let's go ahead and get started, please. Hi, right, welcome. Welcome back. Hope you had a good summer. Uh, this is database management systems. Yes, your alarm is correct. It's time to start class. Um, CSE 530 is the course number, so hopefully you're in the right place. Um, yeah, so today we're going to do typical syllabus day stuff. That's kind of boring, so we're going to get through that as quickly as we possibly can and hop into some material. So let's go ahead and begin. Uh, first off, my name is Doug Shook. I'll be the instructor for this class. Uh, my office is over in Jolly Hall and, oops, my office hours are, uh, I'll have to fix this. Uh, they're posted on the website anyway. It's only Tuesday and Thursday. I'm not sure why it says Wednesday there. Sorry about that. Um, and TA office hours are already posted as well. Um, and since I've already mentioned it a couple times, I might as well go ahead and bring up the fact that uh, everything, uh, course related this semester is going to be up on Canvas. So you can find all the stuff related to the course up on Canvas. Um, hopefully, you, you know, you, some of you may have already had some time to go through and take a look at this stuff. If not, log into Canvas when you get a chance. Take a look. I've got the whole syllabus uh, set up, including due dates for all the assignments, what the topics are going to be every time we meet for class, uh, when the exams are going to be, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so you can find everything on Canvas. Um, cool. And so the office hours that I just mentioned, you know, we got a whole page uh, here as well. You'll notice that I actually don't have locations set up for all of them yet. I'm working on finding spots for them, but I'll get that sorted out and post the info as soon as I find a place uh, for us to hold office hours. Um, all right. So the way that this course is structured. Um, there's really two things you got to worry about. We got homework assignments. There's going to be five of them. Uh, the first one will go out, uh, I can't remember if it'll go out next week or the week after. It's on Canvas. I don't remember, but it's on Canvas. Um, and so then um, that's a big part of the class. 70% of your grade is just based on those homework assignments. Uh, and then the remaining uh, portion of your grade is going to come from midterm and final exam. Uh, so the midterm and final exam dates are already set on the uh, course calendar. Uh, the midterm is going to be during class time, so that one should not be a problem. The final exam will be during the final exam week. Um, so we'll deal with that when we get there. Um, you can work in groups of two on the assignments. In fact, I encourage you to find a partner to work with uh, on the homework assignments. And I'll talk a little bit more about what those homework assignments are going to look like uh, in just a moment. All right, uh, grading and late work and other fun policy stuff. Yeah, so um, grading will be done on a straight scale. I don't really believe in curves. I really don't think curves are a good idea, uh, but you can see that uh, I've got the grading uh, stuff set up on Canvas as well. Uh, so you can take a look at that if you're interested. Uh, late work, um, I'm gonna do things a little bit differently this semester, I'm gonna borrow an idea that I've seen popping up in other classes lately. Uh, as of right now, you all have seven late coupons and each one of those buys you an extra day on an assignment. So I don't care when you use them. I don't care how you use them. Uh, you can use one on every single assignment if you want to. You can use all of them on one assignment if you want to. I don't care. That's up to you guys. You got seven days that you can use uh, throughout the semester to turn stuff in late. You don't have to tell me, you don't have to tell the TAs, just turn your stuff in a few days late and I will notice it when we go through grading and update the um, number of late coupons that you have remaining. Sound good? All right. Um, so we're going to give that a try this semester to see how it goes. Um, let's see, what else? I think I'm covering all the highlights really. All right. Ah, oh, shoot. Forgot. Academic dishonesty. Um, so. 
this is something that is very important to me, something that has actually been a, a kind of a problem in the computer science department lately. Um, collaboration is encouraged, that's why I'm allowing you to work with partners, but there is good collaboration and bad collaboration. So examples of things that would be over the line would be working in groups of more than two students, um, that is strictly prohibited. Uh, showing your group to somebody who is not your partner. So if, if somebody's your partner, of course, you know, go nuts. Show them everything you've done. They can show you all their work. Uh, you know, but you cannot show your work to somebody who is not in your group. Um, and as far as using the internet goes, uh, you know, I expect you to use the internet, uh, but there's definitely a line between using Stack Overflow to help you get out of a sticky situation and copying uh, big chunks of your assignment off of Stack Overflow and submitting that and telling me that you did that work. Um, so uh, I have a very uh, strict zero tolerance policy towards academic integrity. Um, if I determine that uh, the policy has been violated, I am going to immediately um, notify the School of Engineering, at which point you've got two options. You can either accept uh, that a violation has occurred or um, um, you have the right to have a hearing uh, in front of a panel and you and if you choose to go have a hearing then you can present your side of the story I'll present my side of the story and the panel will decide um, whether or not the policy has been violated in any case if the uh, if we determine that the policy has in fact been uh, violated uh, the um, sanction is typically an F in the course. Uh, for a graduate level class, there's really no excuse. It's just automatic F in the class. So it is not worth it to cheat on these assignments is the point I'm trying to make here. Um, taking a zero on assignment is going to be much, 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 much better for you than cheating, getting caught, and taking an F in the course and all the other stuff that comes along with that. I'm not saying that to scare you guys. Uh, the vast majority of students who take my classes are honest, so thank you. The reason that I take this so seriously is because I care about those students and I want to protect the integrity of their grades because anybody who gets uh, away with cheating devalues the grades that are handed out um, in this class and in the department. Um, are there any questions? Yeah. Uh, is there any way when it comes to, for example, and So citing, citing is always, always, always encouraged. You know, if you find something on Stack Overflow that helps you get out of a jam, I'm, I'm you know, of course that's going to happen. I do the same thing all the time, right? That's programming. Um, so yes, just drop a link in the comments telling me where you found it. That's, that's totally fine. Um, these assignments are not small assignments by any means. So if I see uh, one or two lines here or there that look problematic, it's probably you know, the Stack Overflow stuff, right? It's when I see large chunks of stuff that I'm going to start to raise the red flag. So uh, just be smart about it. If you um, find yourself looking at something that could be construed as a solution to the homework assignment, get the heck out of there. That's already over the line, very seriously over the line. Um, if you have any questions about the policy, I'm more than happy to answer them. I actually have a... Um, academic uh, integrity pledge that I'm going to request for you to sign. I don't have it today. I'll bring it uh, next time. I'm going to have you sign the pledge um, uh, and uh, I will need that signed pledge back from you actually before I grade any of your stuff in this class. Um, that goes over the, uh, it's actually really basically the same policy stuff that's on the website. Um, but I just want a signed version of that. Oh, something else that I should mention that's uh, uh, been an issue in previous semesters, especially as it relates to partners. If you work with a partner on an assignment in this class, I expect you to work with that partner on the entire assignment. I do not expect you to chop the assignment into pieces and then complete those pieces individually and stitch them together like some kind of Frankenstein assignment thing. Um, a, I can tell when you do that and it looks really bad a lot of times. It can be done well. I'm not going to say that it can't be done well, but a lot of times it looks really odd when I go to grade stuff. Uh, B, you're hurting yourself because you're going to be tested over the contents of the entire assignment, not just part of it, right? And C, it protects you in cases of academic integrity because 
Um, if your partner goes off and does something that they shouldn't be doing, right? Um, you can be there to say, hey, what the hell are you doing? Cut that out. You're gonna get us both in trouble. Um, stop it, right? So uh, please, 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 please work on these assignments as a group, not two independent people. Any other questions I can answer on integrity stuff right now? Any questions? I think I covered all the policy stuff. Um, so just real quick, uh, how to do well in this class. I've taught this class uh, four or five times, I think, at this point. So um, uh, I've seen a lot of students go through this class. I've seen a lot of students do very well in this class. I've seen some students, unfortunately, not do so well in this class. And so I just wanted to give you some pointers of some things that I've seen uh, about how to do well in this class. First off, it seems obvious, but it's, it's definitely worth saying, you know, put an honest effort into the coursework and learn how to use the debugger efficiently. A lot of times um, uh, I'll get people asking questions about assignments, and one of my first questions back to you is going to be, well, did you try running it through the debugger to see what's going on? And hopefully the answer to that question is yes, right? I want the answer to that question to be, yes, I did use the debugger. Um, if the debugger is scary to you or unfamiliar to you, um, come to my office hours sometime. I'd be happy to show you the ins and outs of debugging your code. We'll actually probably see some examples in class when I do some coding demonstrations. Um, ask for help if you get stuck. So if you, if you put an honest effort into the coursework and you still feel like you're stuck, you're not making any progress, you've tried the debugger and it still just seems like things aren't working, um, come ask for help. Uh, I have office hours. We've got uh, wonderful TAs who just took this class last semester. Um, who are holding office hours, I always, always, always prefer in-person questions. Uh, we do have a Piazza page where you can ask questions online. I, of course, do have an email address, uh, but I prefer that you use Piazza. And actually, I would prefer that you come to my office hours and ask me in person or talk to me after class. The reason being that when I go home at night, I like to not think about work for a little while. I think you guys can probably understand that. You know, I have a wife and kids and a Netflix queue that I'm working on. Um, and so, you know, when my inbox starts to blow up late at night, it stresses me out, man. I'm not gonna lie to you, it really stresses me out. So I'd really prefer to deal with things in person if possible. Um, I really like to put the face to the names, um, get to know you guys a little bit better. So come talk to me. Um, I'm, I'm happy to help you. That's, that's what I'm here for. Um, how to properly ask for help. So if you run into problems, and I expect that you will, right? This is not an easy class. The homework assignments are, are not easy. Um, if you run into a problem, it really can help me if you give me some additional information or the TA some additional information about the problems that you run into. So here are the things that I have tried already, right? Tell us the things that you've tried. That way we don't play this back and forth game of, Oh, have you tried this? Yeah, I tried this. Oh, have you tried this? Yeah, I tried this. Just tell me that up front. That can save us a lot of time. Uh, if you get any errors, it really, 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 really helps if you can tell me the specific error messages that you're getting. Or a screenshot is fantastic. You can just screenshot the error messages that you're getting. Um, you know, if you say, uh, if you make a post on Piazza that says, my code doesn't do X, that leaves a whole lot of potential options as to why your code doesn't do X, right? That, that does not narrow down the problem at all. So try and really narrow down the problem as much as you possibly can um, so that we can hopefully get you an answer um, in as efficient manner as possible. Um, starting on assignments early. Everybody says this, right? I'm sure this isn't the first time uh, some professor who you just met sat up in front of a classroom and said, start your assignments early. Well, there's a reason why we all say it. Um, some of these assignments, as I've already mentioned, are not small. And if you wait, then you're really going to run the risk of not getting them done on time. Um, so I, I would really like to prevent that, not just for your stress level, but for my own stress level. Um, it stresses me out when I see students pulling all-nighters to get stuff submitted. And it's not even me. I don't know what it is. Uh, I am talking to a therapist. So I know I'm talking about stress a lot. So, um, don't worry about me. We're good. But uh, it would make me feel a lot better to see people starting assignments early. Um, so please consider that. Uh, come to class. Another thing that seems pretty obvious. Um, here's why I say this though. I am recording right now and I like recording classes. I think it's good to have a video record of what's happened in class. 
But I want to make it very clear that uh, watching the videos is not an excuse for skipping class. I want you to come here and be in class because I really want classes to be a participatory experience. I ask a lot of questions. Um, I actually stop and ask questions in the middle of lecture quite frequently. Practice problems, we go through lots of practice problems in class quite frequently. There will be some times when I'm just standing up here talking about a particular topic, right? That's part of what class is about. Um, but I know that that gets boring for you all. It gets boring for me as well. So I'd much rather do some practice problems, ask you some questions. <laughs> if the room is half empty, that gets a lot more difficult to do. So please, 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 please come to class. Um, and another reason to consider you know, not relying on the videos is that sometimes they don't get recorded for whatever reason. Sometimes I have computer problems. Sometimes I forget to push a button, you know. Um, these things happen. Uh, so they're, I'm not going to promise you that I'll have a video of every single class. I'm going to try to do the best that I can, but I can't promise I'm going to have a video for every single class. So come to class and take notes. Write things down. Um, you know, it's a, a, I'll, I'll give you some incentive to do that. My exams are almost always open notes, open book. So write some stuff down. You can bring it with you on the exams. You'll, you'll use it later. Um, trying to think of what else. Any questions so far that I can answer regarding policy stuff? Yeah? Uh, if you have a conflict with the exam time, we can try to sort something out. The, the midterm is during class, so I don't expect there'd be tons of conflicts, but I know that sometimes student groups are traveling out of town and stuff like that, and so if that's something um, that is, uh, affects you, then um, you know, email me, not right now, because I'm getting old and I'm going to forget that stuff. So email me closer to the exam time, we'll set something up. Um, we, can make that, we can make that happen. Um, the exam date is already on the calendar, by the way, and that date is not going to change. I might change some of the other dates around of what we do on particular days, but the exam date's absolutely 100% set in stone. Um, so those are not going to change at all. Any other uh, policy questions before we can start talking about content? Yeah? Uh, how far advanced do you usually release the lectures, like the day before you give it? Um, actually, so um, probably even sooner than that. I'm a little behind right now. I'm, um, I used to have a, my own personal website for all this stuff, and now I switched to Canvas. So I actually have most of the slides ready. I just have a backlog of getting stuff moved to Canvas. Um, so once I get a minute to sit down and copy some slides over to Canvas, you'll see them pop up pretty regularly. Yeah. Good questions. Any other questions I can answer for you before we talk about databases? Yes? Ah, great question. So this was actually the next thing on my list. You're a mind reader. Um, the homework assignments, right? And actually, this class in general is not a SQL class. And so I, I want to be careful about what I mean by that. Are we going to talk about SQL in this class? Yes, absolutely. We're going to talk about it today. It's on my agenda for today. Is this a whole semester of talking about SQL? No, 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 no. This is not a class about learning SQL. Um, SQL is a very small part of, it is one topic in a large group of topics that I hope to cover in this class. And so when it comes to homework assignments, right, while there might be small amounts of SQL code involved in the homework assignments, um, the vast majority of your homework assignments are going to be working with things in Java. And so I want to make that very clear right off the bat. The prerequisite for this class is uh, 247, I believe, or 502. Uh, they're the same thing, right? And so that sort of implies that you have done some work in Java. And you have an idea of how to do object-oriented programming, right? There's going to be a lot of object-oriented programming in this class. Um, so if you were coming in here hoping that you would learn how to do some SQL, the answer is yes, you will have to learn how to do some SQL. We're going to cover SQL for, I don't know, maybe a week or two tops. A large part of this class is not going to be focused on how SQL works. It's going to be more focused on how a database works. 
In fact, the homework assignments are going to have us build a database management system from scratch. We're going to start with nothing and build a database management system that can run queries and retrieve data. Um, so that is our goal with the homework assignments in this class. If the idea of doing a lot of homework in Java is something that doesn't sit well with you, a lot of times we have students from uh, who are not comp sci, who don't have a strong comp sci background, or maybe they came from another university um, that didn't do a lot of Java programming. Um, I certainly understand, I certainly sympathize. Um, come talk to me about that. We can try to work something out. Um, but unfortunately, at the end of the day, it, what that really means is you're just gonna have to try, try and pick it up. You're just gonna have to try and pick up Java. Um, or, you know, find a partner who's well-versed in Java who can help you out on the assignments, if that's something that you think is going to be a concern. Any other questions that I can answer when we start talking about databases? Uh, one more thing that I just remembered regarding the wait list. I know there's probably some people in this room who are on the wait list. Um, I want to let all of you in. The reason that I have not pulled the trigger on that yet, quite yet is because I'm still waiting to make sure um, that I have um, enough TAs, basically. So I've hired a certain number of TAs, and if all of them come through and tell me that they're going to be able to TA the course, then I'm going to be able to let everybody in off the wait list. Um, but if I don't get enough TA support, unfortunately, I might not be able to do that. So uh, I know that puts some of you in limbo. I think that the best thing that we can do for now, and I know it's not super satisfying, is to just kind of wait a little bit. Some people will drop the class. That'll help out a little bit. I'm definitely planning on letting in some of the people on the wait list. I just don't know what that number exactly is yet. I'll probably have a better idea on Wednesday. I mean, you know, as every day goes on, I'll have a better idea of what that might look like. If you're really, really, really super worried about getting in off the wait list um, and you're like, at the very back end of the waitlist. If you're at the front end of the waitlist, don't worry about it. You're good to go. If you're sitting at the back of the waitlist and you're freaking out that you're not going to get into class, um, you know, come chat with me after class or uh, shoot me an email and we can we can chat about that. All right. Any other questions before we talk about database stuff? Yeah. Uh, which ID do you find works best for this course? Ah, oh, good question. So I um, I have used Eclipse and IntelliJ. Um, in the past, I've used Eclipse for this class. I actually haven't decided what I'm going to use this semester, though. I've been using IntelliJ more and more lately. Um, so, but I know that around here, Eclipse is, is somewhat more common. I actually know from experience that uh, you know the code works just fine in either IDE. There's nothing stopping you from using either Eclipse or IntelliJ um, to, to work on the homework assignments in this class. So in some sense, it's personal preference. Um, Use what you know. That's the best advice that I have. And uh, yeah, great question. Any other questions before we talk about some course content? Oh, we good? Awesome. Um, yeah, hit me up after class or come chat with me in office hours if you do have questions about course policy stuff. All right, how are we doing on time? Good. Perfect. Yeah, a little less than an hour. We're going to talk about some databases for the rest of the time today. Um, so let me get a feel for where you guys are coming from. This is a graduate level class, but it's also, I, I find, has somewhat of a diverse set of backgrounds coming in. There are certainly undergraduates in this class as well, and some people who are WashU students, uh, longtime WashU students, other people who maybe this is their first semester at WashU. So um, who here has, you know, interacted with a database, like submitted some queries or something, some SQL queries to a database. Okay, so that's about half, I'd say. Right? It's about half. How many of you, um, if I say, uh, go write me a join, I feel like you'd be able to knock that out without any trouble. <coughs> All right, so almost the same, but a little bit less, right? Joins are sort of the big hurdle when it comes to learning SQL in this uh, SQL uh, for a lot of folks. Um, All right, cool. How many of you have actually had a uh, job or internship where you were presumably, hopefully, paid to work with databases? Okay, fantastic, excellent. Um, for those of you who didn't raise your hand for any of those questions, don't worry, it's all right, it's okay. 
I do not assume that anybody has any database experience coming into this class. Um, we will teach you a little bit of SQL. We're going to talk about it a little bit today, actually, as a matter of fact. For those of you who already know SQL, of course, that's going to be a review. I will say that while uh, we talked about SQL in this class, nobody's going to walk out of this class necessarily being a SQL expert, knowing every single possible thing that there is to know about SQL. We cover the very basics, just enough to be able to do the basic functionality on a database server uh, is what we cover in this class. If you're interested in becoming a SQL wizard, um, you know I, I do know a significant about amount about uh, the SQL language and I'd be happy to chat with you about some resources you could use to become more proficient at SQL itself. Um, but I'll explain the kind of SQL we're going to use in this class towards the end of the day today. So uh, this class is all about database management systems and I think most people are probably familiar with the primary <coughs> role of a database management system which is storing data, having a place to put information. But that's not the only role of a database management system. Can, Anybody think, or maybe you have experience, of other things that a database management system is in charge of besides just hanging on to data? It's maybe not a question that you've thought about before, right? It seems like managing data is all a database should have to worry about, right? There's a lot more to it than that. In fact, a lot of you have probably had uh, negative database experiences, and by negative database experiences, what I mean is somebody has hacked in and stolen a database or a website that you've used that's got your personal information in it, right? Credit card numbers, email addresses, whatever the heck it might be. That's happened to lots of folks. It's happened to me several times. Um, so security is part of what a database management system is responsible for as well. Has to manage security of that data. What else? Can anybody think of anything else that a database system might be in charge of? Yeah. Uh, probably have a retrieve and fetch the data. Retrieve and fetch the data. So uh, um, getting data out and then also the opposite, putting data in, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. We're going to talk about both of those things. Anything else? Yeah. Set up correctly so it can interact with the front end. The front end, yeah. So that's a, I'm glad you brought up the front end. Um, there's Kind of two types of database users, right? There's front end users and there's back end users. And in this class, we're going to learn um, a lot of back end stuff. That's what we care about. We're going to take a look at the guts of a database management system. But we're also front end users. We are also front end users. Anytime you go and log into your favorite websites, I go log into Facebook, it checks my password against the database, right? Make sure that that I typed in the right stuff. That's a front-end use of a database. So we are all front-end users of a database. Um, but since this is a computer science class, we're going to focus on the back-end stuff primarily. And it's sort of our job to make sure that, um, as was mentioned, the um, right data and tools are available for the front-end to do whatever it's supposed to do, right? To make other people's lives easier, the front-end users. Great. Anything else you can think of? There's one other big one. Yeah. I don't know if it's ah, perfect. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So maybe the mention of Facebook sparks this uh, thought of, well, wait a second. There's not just one person pinging that Facebook database, right? There's thousands, millions of people interacting with that Facebook database, often at the same time. Right? And so the database has to manage the fact that it's not just one person going back and forth, but many, 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 many people making data requests simultaneously. Lots and lots of parallel requests. In fact, after we get past the first midterm, um, that is going to be one of our primary topics, is how do we manage um, lots of people using our database, not just from a performance perspective, which we certainly care about, right? How can I efficiently service those requests? But also from a correctness perspective, meaning that what if two people want to change the same thing at the same time? How do I handle this, this conflicting request of two people trying to change the same piece of information at the same time? That's part of a database's job, is to manage those kinds of interactions with our users. Um, so that's definitely the, we hit the big ones. Definition actually is maybe one that we didn't quite touch on, 
Uh, let me talk about the ones that we did first. Construction is putting information in. Manipulation might be getting information out. Sharing is having lots and lots of users. Security, we discussed. Performance, I think, applies to all of these. We never want things to go slowly. That's pretty much never our goal. So how do we make things uh, run performance-wise? Definition's one, actually, that we didn't, we didn't touch on, but um, for a database management system, it cares very much about the structure of our data, right? Not just what, what data I have, but what that data looks like. So if I have uh, data representing a person, here's my name, here's my address, here's my email address, here's whatever information I want to track about that person. And not just that, but also what are the data types of those things? So name is a string probably, right? Email address is probably a string, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So database is responsible for managing all of these different tasks. And as we go through the semester, we'll actually touch upon all of these uh, things um, at one point or another. And as we build our own database system via the homework assignments, we'll touch on almost all of these uh, concepts as well. Great. Uh, we actually already talked about users because it was already brought up to us uh, about the two different kinds of users. It's very important for us to keep our front end users in mind. In fact, when we think about the architecture of a database system, uh, a lot of it is uh, exists solely um, so that the front end users can use our database effectively. Um, all right, so what does a database contain? This might sound like another obvious question. In fact, I'll go ahead and give you the obvious answer. It's got data. I just gave you an example of what data might look like if I'm collecting information about a person, right? It's got data in it. Um, what else might a database contain besides data? Does anybody know? If you've been paying attention and can read between the lines a little bit, I've actually already kind of given you the answer to this one. So a database contains data, but what else does it need to contain in order to do its job? Yeah? It needs to a schema. A schema, yeah. So a schema is um, the format that I expect my data to take, right? Uh, for those of you who have used databases before, a schema is basically the definition of um, what columns I expect to see in my tables. We're going to see examples of that in just a little bit. But in a more general perspective, a schema is an example of something um, called metadata. It's data about my data. So it's not just the actual information that I'm trying to store, it's information about my information. And a database has to manage this metadata. That's part of its job as well. It needs to know that there are eight columns in this table and what the names of those columns are and what the data types of those data types of those columns are. It needs to know how many tables there are, right? It needs to know what relationships exist between those tables, if there are any. And we're going to talk about all these things uh, as we go through um, the, the contents of a database. So in some sense, um, the metadata is really more important than the data because I can't put anything into a database without properly specifying the metadata ahead of time. I have to define that schema up front. I have to tell you the structure of my data before I can actually give you any actual data. And storing that metadata is something that the deep, uh, database management system is required to do. So we're going to spend the first, uh, I don't know, four-fifths or so of the class talking about the relational database model. This is by far the most common uh, database model that's in use, but it's not the only one. And other database models, um, things like NoSQL, you might have heard of things like uh, document stores, column stores, right, things like that, um, are starting to become more popular. And we're going to talk about those a little bit at the end of the semester. But the majority of our time is going to be spent talking about examining, manipulating, playing around with this relational database model. Um, if you are writing SQL queries, odds are very good that you're using a relational <coughs> database model. So that could be, uh, and, and actually I want to make it clear that this model is um, in use in all of the major database systems. So Oracle, Postgres, Microsoft has their own database system, right? SQL Server. Um, those are all examples of relational database uh, databases that use the relational database model. 
So in a relational model, our data is all stored in tables. And those tables are going to have one or more columns, which might also be referred to as fields. They mean the same thing. And many, many, many rows, which might be called records. Um, these, are, these tables are modeled after real world entities. And so the attributes are the fields, the columns, and then the rows or the records might be referred to as instances. These are words that I'm almost positive that you've heard before in 131, right? It sounds very analogous to when we talk about objects. There's a clear parallel between an entity and an object. Objects also have attributes. I can also create instances of objects. But there is one thing that objects can do that these entities can't do. What's that? So an object has attributes. Those are the fields, right? Java fields. I can make instances of objects. What else can objects do? I'm sorry? Methods. Methods, behaviors, right? Objects have behaviors associated with them. Entities do not. Entities are just structural. They do not have behaviors associated with them. So that's kind of where the analogy ends. Uh, but the, the, other, the other uses of uh, thinking about entities as objects is, is valuable. Um, every single row within a table is an instance of whatever entity that table represents. So if I have a table storing information about people, users, right? Every single row represents one person, one user. And the columns represent the attributes that I'm storing about that particular user. Another important part of the relational database model is this idea of a primary key. So primary keys are used to uniquely identify each record. And that uniqueness is really the important part. I need to have a unique way of identifying each and every single record. And to understand why, you can actually keep thinking about our example of people, right? If I'm tracking information about a person, think about how you could uniquely distinguish two different rows. Name works pretty well, but not in all cases. There are certainly people that share the same name. Um, email address, you could argue, might work, but even that I don't think is necessarily a guarantee, especially if um, somebody doesn't have an email address, for example, to provide, provide to you. Um, Address doesn't work. Multiple people can certainly live in the same place. You could even conceive of multiple people with the same name living in the same place. It might not be common, but it could happen, right? Could potentially happen. Um, so, um, you know, what can we use to uniquely identify these people then? We want to make sure that we don't get confused. We want to make sure when we talk about John Smith, we know exactly which John Smith we're talking about. That's why we have primary keys. We have primary keys so that there's no question about it. There's no ambiguity. I can use the primary key to uniquely specify exactly who it is that I'm talking about. And primary keys play an important role in other parts of the model as well. Any questions so far? All right. So here's an example of what a table might look like. Uh, this is a table meant to represent employees at a company. Um, this data is extremely old. Uh, data, but you know it doesn't really matter. Uh, it shows when they were born, the first name, last name. It's a table full of boomers, man. Um, I just noticed that. Sorry. And uh, when they were hired at the company. Okay. And so every single row is an instance of an employee, and you can see the attributes for each and every employee as well. This is a, an actual table that um, I will show you how to set up on your own computer if you want to play around with uh, a little bit later on. Uh, but this is what's contained in a database. Everything that's stored in a database takes this format. And when I say everything, I mean everything, including the metadata. Remember the metadata that we were talking about a little bit ago? The metadata is also stored in this format. Everything in the database is stored in tables. So when I say, ah, oh, what columns exist in this table? There's a table somewhere in the database that says what columns exist in the other tables. 
that is part of the data that is stored in a database. All right, cool. Um, so the relational database model gets its name from the fact that we can define relationships between two tables. There are officially three different kinds of relationships. Uh, I only believe in two of these uh, kinds of relationships. Um, but we'll talk about all three anyway for the sake of completeness. Uh, a one-to-one -one relationship means that every record in this table has one associated record in this other table. Okay? A one-to-many relationship means that every record in this table might have many associated records in this other table. And then a many-to-many -many relationship means that um, many rows in this table might have many associated records in this other t table. And we actually physically link those tables up. We make a connection uh, using a relationship between those two tables. One of these three is by far the most common type of relationship. Those of you who have done SQL before might have an idea of which one we use the most. Anybody know? One to many is by far the most common. Uh, so common that many to many is defined as two one to many relationships. Um, and then one to one is the one that I don't think you're ever going to see. You're not going to see it in this class. I don't believe in it. It's like the tooth fairy, um, except it doesn't give me money under my pillow. Um, maybe that was a poor example. It's like the Easter bunny, except it doesn't give me any chocolate eggs in a basket. Um, anyway. Uh, one to many is by far the most common, and that's the one that we're going to be talking about the most. And what do we use to define this relationship? We use the primary key. That's why the primary key is so important. So that primary key is going to be the glue that holds our tables together. And we'll actually see lots and lots more examples of these relationships um, in a future class. I have a whole... Uh, day on the syllabus dedicated to talking about relationships, but real quick, here's an example of a schema. This is your first schema, it's certainly not your last schema that you're going to see in this class. This is a schema, again, defining a database to track information about employees at a company. So the employees table that we were looking at a couple slides back is right there in the, in the middle on the right. And you can see there's a lot of other tables involved here as well. And the lines between the tables represent the relationships. And actually you can see, um, or maybe you can't see, uh, that actually all of these relationships are one-to-many relationships. I can tell by the, the notation of these lines. The, um, the end of the line that is straight and it's got the two, looks like an equal sign, I guess. That's the one side. And the... Uh, side that looks like a fork is the many side. And so the way that I might interpret this is, um, you know, uh, one department, here's the one side, has many managers, has many department managers. Or one employee can have many titles because as you get promoted, your title changes, right? So I used to have this title, now I have this title, now I have this title, right? Um, that's how we would interpret those relationships between these tables. And these are the basic building blocks of a relational database. Any questions? Yeah? For me, think about a, like a one to optional number. Like it may be one or many, but it also may be zero. Um, so one to many actually allows for the case of zero. Okay. Yeah. Basically, it's do you think there's going to be, um, I think the hardest distinction is from one to many to many and many to many. Those are the kind of the hardest two to, to uh, re realize the differences between. There actually is a many to many, there's multiple many to many relationships on this one as well. Um, departments and employees have a many to many relationship in this scenario. And you might be saying, well, there's no line that goes between those two, right? There's no line going directly between those two tables, but actually it's defined as two one-to-many relationships. So one department has many employees, but one employee can also potentially belong to many departments. That's a many-to-many -many relationship. It's bi-directional, it goes both ways. If I can only, if I can only say um, that statement in one direction, then it's just a one-to-many relationship. 
But one to many could be one to zero, or one to one, or one to 700. Yeah, it can accommodate all of those situations. And again, if this is all uh, a little bit hard for you to wrap your mind around right now, don't worry about it. As I said, we've got a whole lecture talking about relationships coming up uh, in just a week or two, actually. It's one of the first things that we're going to talk about. Great question. Any other questions? All right. Um, so at this point, now that I've given you a high-level overview of what, uh, of what the uh, relational database model looks like, I like to compare it to something that most people are familiar with, which is a file system. A file system being you know, the files on your computer. When I go to the C drive and I look at everything that's on there, right? Or Macs don't have C drives. I don't know what Macs have. Macs have something, I'm sure, um, that's similar to a file system. Um, or is a file system, in fact. Um, so it's, I think it's useful to compare and contrast uh, what databases can do versus what file systems can do. Um, databases, compared to file systems, are very consistent. My data has to follow a table-like structure. I have to have rows, columns, right? That's how a database wants my data to be stored. Files can take on many different formats. I can do tables, right? Microsoft Excel, that's what it is. It's basically making tables on my computer, but that's just one type of file that I might find. I might also find music, I might find games, I might find um, you know, any other kinds of files that you could possibly think of. I can find on a computer. So there is no consistent structure for files on a file system on a computer. Um, databases are typically easier to maintain because um, Everything is going to be, well, a lot of things are going to be centralized, not everything. In fact, we're going to spend a whole lot of time uh, later on this semester talking about when things aren't centralized and what that means. Um, but a lot of stuff will be centralized, meaning that I'm going to keep it all in one central location, and there's going to be one definitive copy of that piece of information that's kept in this spot. And that makes it easier to maintain because I don't have to worry about having three different versions of this information out there and having to reconcile those different versions um, when, uh, when I need to use that information. Uh, it can perform validations. So validations meaning if I insert a new user record into the database, it can check to make sure that the email address is valid or they gave me a birth date that is you know, not in the future, right? Things like that. It can actually make sure that my data takes on a valid structure. Um, there, your file system's not gonna do that. I can write programs that will do that for me, but the file system itself is not going to do that for me. Um, a database can enforce relationships. So it, if I have a relationship between two tables, it can enforce that relationship, meaning that I cannot put something into this table unless it um, satisfies the relationship back to this other table. <coughs> Files can be related as well. If I have a game, that game is going to pull on image files and music files and your save data and all kinds of other files and those things that data is all related right but it's not enforced as a user I can go in and I can actually swap out the images or swap out the music or go mess with my save file to give me all the items in the game so that I can cheat right um, and it's not going to stop me from doing that databases can access large amounts of data in a single go so um, while I certainly couldn't, can use a database to pick out a single cell of a table, that is certainly possible, um, databases can also retrieve very large amounts of data. Rows and rows and rows and rows of records at once. Um, file systems can do this too. The big difference between the two is that databases are actually um, more optimized for that scenario. It's, their, it's what they... Uh, it's what they are intended to, to be used for, whereas file systems are, are really meant to handle smaller chunks of data at a time. And databases are also geared towards concurrent access, meaning that I can have multiple people accessing the same set of data at the same time. So another very important thing to consider when we think about databases versus regular file systems is performance. Databases uh, typically have a, a bad rap, I think, when it comes to performance. They're seen as being kind of slow. And, and that's not necessarily wrong. If I'm using databases to you know, fetch small chunks of data, it, it probably is going to be slow versus 
just storing that data in a file on my computer, perhaps. Um, but where databases really are going to illustrate their um, usefulness is when I'm dealing with large chunks of data. The performance will be better um, in those situations because databases are um, prepared for those situations, whereas file systems really are, are geared more towards those smaller chunks of data. So it's relative. Um, performance is a huge, huge topic that we're going to be interested in this class. Uh, it's going to affect every single step along the way. We don't just want to write a database that's going to work. We want to write a database that's going to work and also be efficient. Cool. Uh, any questions? All right. So let's start getting into um, the stuff that you're going to need for your first homework assignment, actually. Uh, we're going to uh, take a brief tour through uh, the database management system here for the last uh, little bit of class. So the database uh, has a couple of different models. The high-level model is a schema. That's what we saw just a few minutes ago. If you're working with the database, or if you've worked with databases in the past, you've probably seen one of these. You're probably somewhat familiar with the idea of a schema. It tells me what tables exist, what columns exist in those tables, how those tables are related to each other. Uh, as humans, um, the, this is, you know, it's maybe a little confusing the first couple times, but it's a pretty organized structure. We can interpret it pretty well. But we have to realize that actually at the end of the day, all of this information is stored on a computer. So is this the most efficient way for the computer to store this data? It is not. Computers store everything in binary values, ones and zeros. And if I'm interested in performance, if I'm interested in retrieving data as efficiently as possible, I need to think about this data not just in this model, but also as a model where the data is represented in binary as ones and zeros. So how is this information actually stored on disk? That's our physical model. That's our low level, our physical model. And that's where we're going to start in this class. That's, that's our beginning point. That's our starting point in this class. Um, homework one, which is again coming out in a week or two, uh, is going to have you develop the physical model for a database system, meaning I'm going to be reading information out of a file, binary information, ones and zeros, out of a file, and interpreting that correctly as strings, as ints, as other data types that we want our database to have. And we're also going to have to put information into those files as well. If I get a new record, I want to insert that information. So again, just to make it very clear, right? The way that this data is laid out is very nice for us, but it's not the most efficient way to actually store it on file, on disk, for the computer to access in an efficient manner. So we've got that schema model, that high-level schema model, which is great, does its job very well. And then we have this lower-level physical model, and then we have a mapping that exists between the two. This part of my physical model maps to this part of my schema. If somebody requests something from this table, I know that physically it's located here, and here's how I can retrieve that information. Make sense? So we're going to spend a lot of time talking about this physical model in the coming days. In fact, uh, Wednesday's class is dedicated to talking about the physical model, but just to give you a brief uh, introduction um, to the physical model right now, um, let's talk about heap files. So heap files are um, one way that we can store data physically on disk um, for our database. It's not the only way. In fact, if you look at um, professional grade uh, databases, your oracles, they probably are not using heap files, as a matter of fact. They're probably using some other type of data structure. But we're going to use heap files in this class, the primary reason being that it is simple. It's a very simple uh, way of storing our data. So the word heap there is not uh, a coincidence. It's very much related to the heaps that you learned about in uh, 247, I presume. Um, and so 
when I think about a heap file, there's really three main operations that we need to worry about. How do I put data in? How do I get data out? And how do I delete stuff? How do I remove data? So if we think about things from a heap data structure, right? What's the, if I have a file with data in it um, that represents a table, right? What's the simplest way that I can add information? If I have a new row coming in, I have a new chunk of data, I want to add it to that file. What's the simplest way for me to do that? The easiest possible way for me to add data to a file. Just put it on the end. Just tack it on the end. That's the easiest possible way, right? There are some downsides of doing it that way. What's the downside of doing it that way? I'm sorry? When you want to find it? Um, so searching is uh, something that we're concerned about, for sure. And how we add data actually does have a direct relationship to how we find data as well, right? But I should still be able to find information, even if I append it all. What's the, what's the bigger issue at hand here? So memory is a concern. We're getting a little bit closer. I'm sorry? What if it already exists? So that could be a potential problem. That's actually a search and replace <laughs> problem, right? Or, or what if there's a, a chunk of space earlier on in the file that could hold that data, and I just tacked it on the end? Now I've made my file bigger for no good reason, right? It's potentially an inefficient use of space, right? That's a problem too. Um, space is pretty cheap, right? But if we think about a database that's going to be potentially very large, you know, that space is, is something that we need to consider for sure. So it's a trade-off. Appending stuff to the end of the file is very quick, very simple, but it's not efficient from a space perspective. The, the converse of that is, well, I can try to be more efficient from a space perspective. Let me go through the file and see if I can find a hole, right? See if I can find a gap that will fit, but that's going to take longer. It's going to take me a little bit longer to find that, that spot, right? Um, so it's really kind of a matter of what you want to emphasize. Do I want to emphasize uh, keeping things as small and compact as possible, or do I want to emphasize just pure speed um, when it comes to insertion? And searching can be kind of the same way, right? So actually, searching can be a very complex problem. How do I find a piece of data? If I say, find all employees with the last name of Shook, right? Well, you'd say, all right, just scan through the whole file until you see the word Shook pop up. That doesn't quite work. Especially in this case, as shook is actually a word and might show up in other places and other contexts. So I need to be a little bit more careful than that. It needs to be in the particular column, the last name column. It can't just show up anywhere. So the schema does come into play here. The structure of my data does matter. I'm looking not just for a piece of information, but a piece of information in a particular column, in a particular attribute. Not only that, but there's other problems with searching that can, that can uh, get in our way. For example, um, what if I have two employees and um, you know one of their so my name's not super long, right? Doug Shook is pretty short, but what if somebody has a really long name? What does that mean for the the row of data? It's gonna be it's gonna be bigger, right? It's gonna physically take up more space because their name is longer than my name is. So it's physically going to take up more space. So how do I know then when this, this row stops and the next one begins? Remember, we're looking at ones and zeros here. I'm looking at stuff on disk, in binary. And I have to know when this, one, this row stop, stops and the next one begins. That's a problem. That's a problem. There's actually two solutions to this problem, or actually probably more than that, but two common solutions to this problem. Can anybody think of a possible solution? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So one solution is I'm not going to let rows be different lengths. I'm going to make every row be the same length. So what does that mean in our example then when somebody has a longer name than me? How do I make sure that they're both the same length? Yeah. Just pad it out. Yeah. Just pad it out. So the downside, of course, there, again, 
it's that same trade-off that we were talking about a little bit ago, right? Inefficient use of space. I'm storing these extra padding spaces that, yes, they do make my life easier when it comes to searching, but I'm giving up space for that. I'm giving up space that I don't necessarily need to use for that purpose. Whereas there's an alternative where I can actually save that space, some of that space anyway. What might I do if I, if I don't want to use the padding? Think about, uh, I don't know if, how many of you in here have taken 332, but think about like a string in C, for example. It's a null terminator on the end, right? I could use a similar way to terminate the end of my rows. Just put some kind of a marker, some kind of an indicator that says, this is the end. This is the end of the row. Again, that saves me the space, but makes searching a little bit more difficult because now I can't just skip ahead a predetermined number of bytes to find the next row. I have to scan it until I see that terminator, and then I know that the next one starts. So where do I want that trade-off to occur? Do I want to save the space, or do I want to save the, the search speed? That's the that's a question, and there's not necessarily a right answer to that question. It's really, you know, what where do you want to save it? Yeah. I'm sorry. Like, what, what if someone adds like you know the exact bits that are terminated? Uh, the terminator, yeah. So the terminator could potentially show up somewhere in the row. That is correct. Um, but if we're talking about ASCII, um, there are special characters that I would not expect to find in strings normally. In fact, there's a null character in ASCII specifically for situations such as this, where Yes, they could technically be in a string, but um, I would not expect them to be in a string. Or I could um, do some additional, if I was really worried about it, I could do some additional pre-processing on the data ahead of time. <coughs> Make sure it's not there. But that's extra work too, right? And it gets back to this idea of this, this trade-off between <laughs> speed and um, space. It's going to be a reoccurring theme in this class. I can do things faster, but I'm going to have to give up some space to do it. Or I can make things take up less space, but I'm going to have to give up some speed to make that happen. That trade-off is a very common theme in this class. Uh, removing data. So if I want to take something out, well, we can actually, the first part of removing is something that we've already talked about. I have to search. I have to find it. But then what? Let's say I've found it. I've searched for it. I've found the record. What does it actually mean to remove it? Just zero it all out? Did you have a suggestion? Was that what you were going to say? Just zero it all out? Yeah. So if I zero it all out, I now have a hole there, right? So there's a couple things that I can consider when it comes to that hole. One thing is I can just assume that something's going to come along later and fill it. Like, okay, yes, there's a gap here, but I assume that eventually something's going to come along and fill that gap. Or I can do something about it myself, right? I can actually move everything else up and totally take that, that gap out. And you can, again, see the trade-off there, right? One of them is going to leave that hole. It's going to leave some unused space for a while, but it's going to make things pretty quick if I'm looking for uh, a gap for some additional data. Whereas moving everything to really re remove that unused space from the file is going to take some work. It's going to take some time but it will compact my space. It will be an efficient use of space. So that trade-off exists there as well. Fortunately, there's some tricks, and we'll talk about, uh, well, they're not tricks. It's really just uh, smart ideas, ideas that were um, thought of by uh, people long before me um, to help us manage this process. There's, there's actually one um, very convenient structure that we can use uh, to help make the heap file um, a lot more efficient for all of these areas, as a matter of fact. Um, and that is a header. I can, the simple act of adding a header onto the heap file can make uh, adding data, finding data, or moving data uh, a lot more efficient. This is something that we're going to talk a lot about on Wednesday. I'm not going to go into it too much right now, but I want you to consider that the actual, the, the mere act of adding a header onto my heap file, right? very much illustrates the fact that I've got two models here. I've got a physical model that is tracking how data is stored on disk, and the header of that heap file is one such structure that I'm using to help me track what data is stored on disk. I am not going to see that header show up here 
That is not something that my front end users care about. That is not something that they need to know. They don't care how that data is stored on disk. They just want to get that data off, right? They don't care how it happens. That's not their concern. That's something that the data, it's magic to them, right? It's just database magic. That's something that we care about. So we've got two models here. I've got the physical model. How do I actually efficiently store data and retrieve data in an efficient way on disk? And then how do users view that data, retrieve that data? Um, and then there's a mapping between. Oh, you, this user requested certain values from this column in this table. Okay, this table is stored in this file, right? I have this many positions in this file. Let me go find you know, the data that's in this particular position and retrieve that for this user using the header that I've got in my heap file, um, right? And so we have to be able to make those connections between the two models in order to service requests to our database. Are there any questions about that? Um, I know it's just kind of a high level. I don't have time to go into the full heap file structure right now. Unfortunately, we're uh, running a little bit short on time, but um, this is what we're going to talk about on Wednesday. Any questions I can answer for you right now? All right. Um, so then the fact that we have these two different models leads to a, an idea called uh, data independence, uh, where logical data independence is this idea that I can change the high-level schema without affecting the physical layer, right? without affecting the physical model. So I can make changes to what the schema looks like, but the data on disk it remains unaffected. Or the opposite, physical data independence would be I can make changes to how data is physically stored on disk that isn't going to affect the schema. One of these is easy, and one of these is hard. Which one sounds easy? Being able to change the physical layer without affecting the schema or being able to change the schema without affecting the physical layer? Which one of those sounds easier? Anybody have any ideas? Yeah. Changing the physical without changing the schema. Changing the physical layer without affecting the schema is easier. Again, for part of the reasons that we were just talking about, uh, the physical layer is under the hood for a lot of people. It's a, it's a black box of magic that does what it needs to do, right? Um, they don't, you know, your average front end user isn't even aware that the physical layer exists. It's not something that they care about. So if it changes, it's not something that they're easily gonna notice. And it's much easier for us to update uh, our mappings on the physical end um, than, uh, than the opposite. If I try to make um, the opposite happen, uh, the logical, chain, make changes to the logical schema without affecting the physical layer, what ends up happening a lot of times is that now I have multiple methods of retrieval, which is certainly doable, but inefficient. It's much better for me if I have a single um, method of data retrieval from the physical layer to keep everything consistent. All right, great. Um, so we've got about 10 minutes left, and to wrap things up for today, I'm going to talk just very briefly about SQL uh, the language. We're going to see SQL pop up uh, you know, from time to time. Uh, we're going to slowly add on new bits of the language as we progress through the class. Um, but today we're just going to introduce some very, very, very basic parts of SQL. Uh, if you've done any kind of SQL programming before, I bet you've already seen the stuff that I'm going to talk about today. Um, but there are lots of people who haven't, so uh, we're going to spend some time chatting about it. Uh, there are two types of the SQL language. There's the data definition language. The data definition language is a language that is used to define schemas. I want to create a table. I want to create a column in a table. I want to create a relationship between two tables. Those are all data uh, definition uh, types of tasks. Data manipulation is what I would expect most of you to probably have had experience with if you have SQL experience. That's going to be things like retrieving information from a table, putting information into a table, right? deleting stuff from a table. Those all fall in the data manipulation realm of the language. So for the first part of the class, we're definitely going to stick with the data manipulation piece. Um, but later on, we will talk about how to do um, do some data definition tasks as well. And so the basic SQL clauses that I'm interested in talking to you about today um, 
you can see up here on the screen. So let's talk about these a little bit. Whoa, where'd it go? Okay, it's there. Go away. All right. So um, there are five clauses here. They're actually listed in the order that I would expect them to appear if I was going to write a SQL query. So all five of these clauses are used for retrieving information from a database, pulling information out of one or more tables. We're just going to basically uh, very quickly and um, basically cover uh, the roles of each of these five clauses. So the select clause, actually maybe somebody can help me out if you've done SQL before. What's the select clause responsible for in a query? What do I use it to tell me? What columns you want? Okay. What's the from clause used for? The table. It's easier to write like this, I think. All right. What's the where clause for? Conditions. Conditions. So, or you might hear it referred to as like a filter. I don't want all of the rows. I only want the rows where this condition is true. I provided some sort of Boolean expression, right, to tell me exactly what rows I want. So a condition or a filter. So those three are probably the most common. They're also probably the most straightforward. Um, actually, let's skip group by for a second and talk about order by. This one is almost self-explanatory, right? It's just sorting. I can sort it either ascending or descending on one or more columns. Okay, but last we have this group by clause. So group by is a tricky one. Group by is a tricky one to deal with. Um, does anybody know what group by is used for, or when it might be used? So this is, I think one that does require uh, a bit of explanation. The, the name group by seems pretty straightforward, right? But there's actually um, another piece of information that you need to be aware of um, in order to use a group by. A group by is almost always, or maybe even always, going to be used with an aggregation. An aggregation being the typical kinds of statistical aggregations that you're used to thinking about. Max, min, average, sum, right? Those are all examples of aggregations that can be performed. So a group by is going to be used in conjunction with an aggregation so that I can perform, instead of performing that aggregation over all of the rows, I can actually say group the rows by this piece of information and perform the aggregation on those individual groups. In other words, if I were to run an average statement by itself without a group by, I would get one number back, the average of all of the rows for that particular column. If I run an average with a group by, I would get one number back for every unique value in the grouping. So if I'm grouping by, um, oh gosh, what's a good example? If I'm grouping by city, I would have one average for St. Louis, I'd have one average for Chicago, I'd have one average for New York City, right? I'd have one average for Dallas, right? So group by allows me to compute aggregates, not just on the entire results, but over uh, subsets of the results. So you can say that it's um, how aggregate is applied. These are not the only five clauses that you're going to run into when talking about SQL queries, but these are the five that we're primarily going to stick with. There are some other ones that may pop up from time to time in this class, and there are certainly some other uh, types of SQL things that I want to talk to you about in this class, but as far as data retrieval goes, these are the five that I'm primarily concerned with. These are the five that I'm going to ask you to implement in one of the homework assignments. Not the first one, actually. It'll be homework assignment two or three coming up down the road. But 
Um, so we have some time to play around with these um, and get used to um, how they work. And so um, one thing that we can also talk about here is, you know, how to actually use these. They're not all required, so I don't need to use every single one of these clauses in every single query that I write. The only two that are required, absolutely 100% required in a query, are these two, select and from. The other three are optional. I can include them if I need them to perform whatever task it is that I'm trying to perform, but the only two that I absolutely need are select and from. And so the simplest query that you can write, the quote unquote hello world of SQL queries is select star, star meaning all of the columns from some table name. Employees is the table we were looking at earlier. This is the simplest possible SQL query that you can write. We are going to see SQL queries that are a lot more complicated than that, um, but for starters, this is the, this is the um, typical starting off SQL query. And from there, if I want to, um, you know, do things that are a little bit more refined, I can take the star off and put, you know, actual specific columns in there. Or I can add a where clause to filter out some rows so that I'm not just looking at the entire table, I'm looking at part of the table, only, only the parts of the table that I care about for the task at hand. Um, we're going to get a lot of practice uh, writing some of these queries. One of the things that we're going to do um, in the upcoming classes is we'll have some practice problems in class, and a lot of times those practice problems will involve um, writing some SQL queries. So we'll get some practice doing that in the coming weeks. I just wanted to briefly introduce, uh, introduce these five clauses now. Are there any questions? Uh, I don't know when, I guess we're supposed to stop about now. Yes. I'm going to stop now, whether I'm supposed to or not. Um, that's all there is for today. So thank you, every, everybody, for coming. I'll stick around for a few minutes if you have any questions. Otherwise, I'll see you on Wednesday. Uh, does the work we're doing...